treat your bread like red wine, you know. Um, you would ask questions. We are assuming a huge way of thinking is that the that the bread that we're buying is nourishing. Well, you have to stop and, and look at it and look at the label. So that's your first thing. Never pick up a bread without looking at the label and turning it over. Look at the list of ingredients now. The the second you see an extremely long list of things you cannot pronounce or you do not recognise, put it down. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the label says on the front, put it back. Be prepared to put that bread back on the shelf and say, no, I am not accepting this bread today. I want something that is going to nourish me. I'm not feeding myself, I'm nourishing myself. So that is about changing your attitude. Then you need to look out for the simplest of ingredients. Let's start with flour, water, salt. But the thing that I get really excited about is actually the level of fiber and the proportion of fiber to the proportion on the label. So I tend to, if I have to buy bread in the supermarket, I tend to look for anything above six grams per hundred grams minimum. What would be the what would be the sort of um, breads that you'd be advising um, listeners to try if they're if they're starting out on this on this journey? The one with the label that's looking for whole grain. I'd be looking for the whole the words whole grain. But even then, there are problems that, as as Tim mentioned, that some people can fake it. You know, it looks like it could be good. That's why I'm saying you need to get in a relationship with your bread and dig a little deeper, find out a little bit more about it because they can fake that whole grainness. And a few a few extra tips and tricks here. So words like uh, granary mean nothing. And uh, malted loaf is actually just adding probably more sugar to it. Um, and so there's lots of ways that you're being fooled when you buy bread. And so, you know, the, if there is a label, try to look at the carbohydrate to fiber ratio. And that should be relatively low. So it should be around four or five to one for a, for a decent loaf. Uh, the worst kind of supermarket bread is about 17 uh, eight, 20 to 1 ratio. So there's a huge difference in that. Now, beware though that in, in many supermarkets, you that smell of bread hits you as you go around the aisle and those breads that they uh, make on the premises don't have a label and they just put them in bags and you've got no real idea what's in them. And you it's all a big con because that bread is often a year old. Oh, really? I was going to say, it sounds good. They made the bread in the premises. Surely this is, um, this is the best stuff, no? No, it's, it, it's, it's pre-frozen, it's pre-cooked, and basically they just have to um, uh, defrost it and uh, give it a final toasting. And that's how they get away with uh, making it uh, this so-called fresh, you know, baked on the premises. And it means they also don't have to put a label on it. They don't have to say what additives they put in it. And it's all a giant con. Um, but it does smell nice and makes you extra hungry as you're going around the supermarket. <laughs> what about the gluten? You mentioned it right at the beginning. I think there's a lot of people who are concerned about being you know, sensitive to gluten. Um, you know, bread is the number one thing that people associate with this. Uh, Tim, is this, how, should people think of, how should people think about this? Well, 1% of people, 1 in 100, are actually uh, have a, a real sensitivity or an allergy to gluten. And these people have celiac disease, and it's a, it's a relatively common, if you think 1 in 100 is common, autoimmune condition that uh, this doesn't apply to. They, they, they will be vomiting, they'll feel really sick, they won't be able to gain weight. There's, there's no in-between uh, area there. But... Recently, in the last 20 years, we've seen this massive increase in uh, gluten sensitivity, which is people that aren't, don't have the antibodies, they're not uh, physically sick, they just might feel bloating or other symptoms when they, uh, they feel they're, they're eating gluten. When, when these people, and this is, this is, this percentage is going up all the time, and it's latest surveys around 10% of people say they have gluten sensitivity. Uh, when these people are actually tested blind with, say, gluten-free pasta or, uh, or um, gluten pasta, and they're not told which is which, about 80% uh, of them turn out not to be uh, gluten sensitive. They have just got it wrong or they've just uh, made a mistake because the gluten is associated with other foods. So there's a whole group of people that 
are mistaken that it's gluten that's causing their problem. Uh, there are still some people that do have a sensitivity to it, and they may well have other conditions like irritable bowel syndrome or um, other allergies, as which have increased dramatically in the last few years, um, but may just be a, a general symptom of their problem rather than the cause of the problem. And that's, that's I think, uh, well, where most of the scientists and doctors in this field are coming from, that uh, no one really believes that gluten is causing these problems other than for the celiac. Uh, it, it is just a, a sign that people eating gluten type foods or maybe cheap sandwiches or other things that contain it, they're eating other things along it that are uh, giving them bad microbes. The worse your state of your microbes, the less you are able to, in a way, deal with uh, some of the foods we eat. And this is a bit of a symptom of the Western gut. But as I said, most people are actually mistaken and they're not uh, intolerant of gluten when they're tested in a scientific way. And I think that's very important to to realize. If we've cleared that up, Vanessa, can you clear up the sourdough mystery for us? So it's almost impossible now for me not to buy some bread that says sourdough on it. I'm still a bit unclear, though, really what it is. Could you help us to under understand? And and maybe Tim can help us understand if you know there's really the health benefits associated with this um, uh, with this as well. So I'm currently finishing my doctorate in nutrition and digestibility of bread. It's taken me a, a long time and uh, it's hard work. Apparently they don't give doctorates away. <laughs> so um, most of my work for the, the past 20 years has been combining uh, the potential health benefits of sourdough and long slow fermentation uh, w with that understanding of how that plays with the gut and the microbes in the gut and the impact on mental health. So the first thing to say is um, sourdough is a combination of wild yeast, that's yeast that's in the air and yeast that you capture, and lactic acid bacteria. Now you'll be familiar with these bacteria because you will have come across them in yogurt, you'll have come across them in vinegar. These are uh, chocolate, um, even coffee and tea is fermented cheese is fermented. So we're very, very, very familiar with these um, microbes. And we know that what they actually do is uh, they feast on the available sugars. And there's a symbiotic relationship with the yeast. And they produce two types.